uh, via telephone. Senator Patricia Rucker joins us now from the 16th Senatorial District. Senator Rucker, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be back on with you guys. Hope you are all doing well. We are. Thank you very much. And uh, it's great to have you on for the first time in this legislative session. Uh, You have a different role now. You are no longer the education chair. You are now the alternative education chair, correct? That's correct. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of your responsibilities during this session? Well, um, essentially any legislation that involves the uh, school choice options that we have in the state, other than public school, will essentially be sent to my committee. I I think this is a credit to you, uh, Senator, that you have been able to make the uh, uh, the choice element uh, to the level what it is now that there can be and there is a committee just for alternative education. So I I commend you for the work that you've done in prior sessions. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Yeah, so. I do feel that um, you know there's definitely you know some issues with implementation that need to be, you know, carefully um, looked at and worked at to make certain that those choices really are um, available to families. Okay. In the, as uh, the education chair, uh, you work very closely with the school board, the West Virginia school board. Will you be yes. doing the same, same involvement as alternative education that you, with the school board as you did before? Yes. That is exactly right. I'm still working very closely with the state school board, still working with HEPC, still working um, with, uh, you know, basically all those same type of folks because, you know, it it is all related. And all of these West Virginia kids, we want to make certain that it is a seamless option, meaning that it is just as good if you attend public school as if you decided to homeschool as if you attended a public charter school or if you want to attend a private school, all options um, are good and we should be helping them. And I really appreciate the State Board of Education's willingness to, you know, to try to get to that point where, you know, we will help the students and the families of West Virginia find what works best for them. Let's develop that a little bit more. The State Board of Education, uh, what role, do they have a specific role in alter, with alternative education, the charter schools? For charter schools, um, so yes. They, so let me, um, let me try to explain it this way. So the State Board of Education still maintains the overall responsibility for overseeing education in the state of West Virginia. So charter schools are considered public schools. As a matter of fact, it's the best way to describe it is they are individual LEAs. So um, the county districts are considered, you know, a district with many schools underneath it. A public charter school, it's its own district. So the State Department of Education treats the public charter schools kind of, not exactly, but kind of equal in terms of the communications. So they must add the public charter schools to whatever communications they would normally send out to all the public schools. And all of the resources and opportunities and things that we are trying to do to help improve education in West Virginia also pertain to the public charter schools. And what has, you know, I mean, it's going to take a little bit of time since this is a brand new thing and we're all just starting out. But one of the bumps that we had in the first year of public charter schools opening was that communication, making certain that they weren't left out. Um, And that's just one example. Um, Also, students that choose to do alternative education still have to turn in proof of assessment to their local county district schools. So, you know, all, even if you choose not to attend a public school in the state of West Virginia, the local district school that you are assigned to still has some overall responsibility to know where you are and how you're doing. So you're saying that the uh, State Board of Education does have oversight responsibility of the public charter schools? Yeah, they okay. do, yes. And, <laughs> there and, are some things that all public charter schools 
have to be doing. And what and, uh, the department needs to make certain that's happening. And so. what stick, if I can use the term stick, what stick uh, do, does the uh, State Board of Education have if a public charter school is failing in some regard? So the public charter schools have a five-year, I guess you'd say, period of time in which to demonstrate that they are reaching the goals that were agreed upon. Um, and then if they don't reach those goals, they can, they will close. So it's it's not like public schools. They they will close if they don't reach the goals that they um, set forth. But in addition to that, there are a few things we put into state code. And I'm sorry, it's been a while since I looked at that code section. But there's a few things if we find out is happening, like um, misuse of funds, I think, um, ch- children not being in a safe environment that can cause them to close immediately. So those are the kind of things that there is, you know, oversight by the state board and the professional charter school board. And if there's anything like that, they can be put, shut down. Since the charter schools were formed by the, uh, by the legislators, uh, if there is a problem that's recognized by the State Board of Education, does the State Board of Education have the authority to close them down, or do they refer them back to you to be the appropriate action? No. If, if, if I mean, I remember specifically if it's a safety issue, they they close it down. They, the State Board of Education has that authority to actually yes. close them down. That's very yes, interesting. Thank you. So. Senator Patricia Rucker, our guest here on the program. If we could, I'd like to change uh, gears here and move on to the governor and the House and their 50% tax cut proposal. The headline I saw on the state uh, news network the other day was at the Senate, it's dead on arrival, Patricia Rucker. Is that true? Um, So I don't want to say that they were misleading, but I think they might have been exaggerating a teeny bit. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yes, I, I I can tell you that it is definitely still being discussed. It is still something that we are working through. I can't give too much details, unfortunately. I don't have the liberty to do that. But, you know, we definitely would like to do uh, tax reduction for the state. And we are trying to find the best way to do that. Is trying to find the best way to do that a way of saying that we'd still kind of like to do that amendment to work around for business and inventory and personal property tax? Well, I have to be completely honest that I missed the last two days here at the legislature. Before I left, um, I had not heard any mention of a workaround, but that doesn't mean that there were discussions I may have missed. So just to be perfectly clear, um, I I have not heard um, okay. us talking about that workaround. And your personal feelings on a tax restructure, Senator Rucker, what would you like to see it look like? Well, there's a lot of things I would like to see, and it's, keep in mind, I'm not in finance. Correct. So I'm not necessarily in all those meetings that are, you know, might be occurring. I support uh, personal income tax reduction and elimination. I would support moving in that direction, have always supported it, have always voted um, for it every single time we've had a bill in front of us. I also, you know, would love to just um, do some things to protect taxpayers. Um, For example, there's some legislation that other states have passed, like truth in taxation, where we make it very transparent what you are being taxed and why and where it's going to. And I would love to, like, have that kind of transparency for our voters. There's so much confusion and so many people that just don't understand Um, how taxes work. And I think education is one of the best ways towards moving towards reform. And that education really needs to happen by making it easier for people to understand and to see what is going on. Um, And I would love to do um, something like a taxpayer bill of rights, um, which, you know, would essentially ensure that any raising of taxes um, would only happen under certain circumstances. Go ahead, Bill. I was going to say, there's been an argument made by uh, Senator Tarr, uh, and I think also by Senator Blair to some degree, uh, that there's not going to be enough money to afford this 50% personal tax reduction. Uh, Have you looked at these numbers? Are you comfortable there be that we can afford 
the 50% tax, 50% tax reduction? So I feel we do have money to do some income tax reduction. In terms of how much and how fast, I think that's where the negotiation and talking is happening. So, you know, I'm, I agree that we should be careful and we should not um, really, it's not a good plan to reduce taxes based on one-time money. It's, it's, that's, you're kind of being a little bit, um, you know, taking some risks if you're using one-time money to reduce taxes because that one-time money is not coming again necessarily. Having said that, you know, we have been making good decisions in the last uh, four years and have held a flatline budget, and I think those type of things do give us, uh, you know, some comfort that we, we can be trusted to be responsible to make difficult decisions. Um, and, and control the uh, growth of government. And those things, you know, should allow us to be able to return money to our citizens. And, you know, there is no better time than now because, they, you know, everyone is struggling, everyone. I mean, inflation is affecting um, everyone across the entire state. And, and the Eastern Panhandle, I can tell you, before I came, um, we were having discussions about the affordability of homes there are, you know, folks in the Eastern Panhandle that are literally not um, able to find housing. And I have constituents who, you know, are proposing moving out of Jefferson and Berkeley County. And, you know, I don't, that, that bothers me. I, I hate the thought of um, folks not being able to stay at home. It's different if they choose to move. Um, but if it's because they can't afford the taxes that are increasing on their properties, that really breaks my heart. Um, and there's lack of available houses to rent. Um, folks are, you know, basically complaining that, yeah, they're finding employees, but their employees are having to drive some very long distances. Yeah, and this flatline budget, uh, certainly that's, some, uh, that's an issue that uh, you and others have, um, have advertised as, as taking, taking credit for. But there's been some downside to that as well. Uh, I'm thinking about PEIA, uh, which the, that ball has been kicked down the road for the last three or four years. Uh, it's my understanding within two years' time, three years' time, it's going to take more than $300 million to fix that. Same thing with DHHR. Uh, has a flatline budget actually actually had its con- unintended consequences? Well, I don't think the PIA kicking it down the road really is have, has anything to do with the flatline budget. But the um, flatline budget, being able to hold things, um, uh, you know, not growing, I think that just shows responsibility because our population currently is not really growing. It is in the eastern panhandle, thank goodness, um, and in some other areas of the state. But overall, the state is losing population. And when we're losing population, it doesn't make any sense for our government to grow. So we're asking a fewer number of citizens to essentially continue to carry the burden of our government and all of the services. So in that situation, a flatline budget is actually responsible and makes sense. And some states have passed uh, what they call a um, population where they um, index the growth of government to the population growth. And it actually makes sense. If If your people grow, if you're growing in size, it makes sense for the services to grow with that. But when it's shrinking, it also makes sense that government should be shrinking. We haven't necessarily been shrinking, although we have streamlined some things, but um, it's just been responsible uh, governance to just control the size of our government, of our spending, while our population is decreasing. I yield to you that the PIA may not be a, a good example. Probably a better example would be what we pay with some of our salaries, most notably the prison prison guards, where we're unable to keep sufficient prison guards without resorting to the National Guard. Uh, what do we do about some of the salaries of these uh, special specialties that we're losing? Well, and, and with the danger of repeating myself, yep. uh, you have heard me say it many times, we absolutely need to do locality pay. Yes. It just has to happen. Um, we're, we're definitely struggling in keeping um, 
not just correctional officers, but CPS workers, police officers, sheriffs, municipal police, like just name the gamut of state employees. Uh, DOH is um, struggling, and it's all based on in our area and some areas of the state, we just are not paying salaries that are commiserate with the cost of living there. So in whatever way we can try to balance it out. I have said ever since I got here to Charleston that it doesn't make sense to have statewide um, salary scales that we put into state code. And if we ever want to change it, we have to pass a law. Um, it, it, to me, it makes more sense that we allow flexibility within the agency to be able to pay what you would call competitive wages. But, um, Having said that, it's proven to be difficult. It is hard to get, you know, the folks representing the entire state to understand um, the, that flexibility needs to be there. But we're working on it. And I think we're, you know, we have excellent representatives from the Eastern Panhandle, um, delegates and senators. And we understand and know that uh, this has to become a priority. Bill, I got to jump in just before we go, because I want to give Senator Rucker a chance to talk about some of the lead sponsor bills that she's offered this year on your Senate page. That list is 16 strong. Senator Rucker, are there any particular ones you want to bring to people's attention? Well, I'm really excited about today, which is Dyslexia Day here at the legislature. Um, And I have a dyslexia bill that's actually going to come up on Monday. So it's not even on your list, probably. And um, I really am hoping that that finally gets through. I've actually tried for a couple years. Um, Senator Barrett was, you know, a lead sponsor of that legislation in the House. And we are trying to get dyslexia and dyscalculia and dysgraphia and and these very specific um, learning challenges is the way I prefer um, talking about them, Mm -hmm. recognized by the state and one of the goals of the bill is to make certain that there is somebody in every single school who can screen for these challenges so that those kids get recognized and get the extra support they need so that they can be successful. So we're going to see if we can get that through this year. And of the others that you've sponsored that are on your list of 16, Senator Rucker, are there any particular ones you want people to know about? So... um I I mean, there's a lot of things that are, you know, I don't know. It's kind of hard because it's it's particular requests that folks have made. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me ask you this one here. Requiring medical professionals, this is SB 155, to report injuries and side effects from vaccines to the Bureau for Public Health. I'm surprised to learn that that's not already a requirement. It seems like there should be some type of registry for that. You would think, but nope, it's not currently in um, required. And yeah, I, to me, that seems like common sense. And especially with all of the concerns and questions and people, you know, have conspiracies. Like, let's get to the facts. Let's let's get the numbers and the data, and then we know. Right. I, I'm surprised that that's. Does that include the standard vaccines required for school? Yes, it would be any vaccination. And those those vaccination records are not currently reported to the Bureau of Public Health as to side effects? So, no, actually, there is no requirement to report them. Usually, the doctors and nurses um, can report it to the national VAERS database, Mm -hmm. but there is no requirement that it be reported to the state. Interesting. I, I had no idea. Had I not seen that bill being offered by you, SB 155, would have, I would have thought that that would have been reported. When it's reported to the national database, is it tagged to a state? Could you go back in? It's no. Not, okay. I actually tried to look that up, and I could not find it. So they're not, they're not putting it at least in any kind of easily searchable you know, way so that you can just look up how many adverse reactions have we had in the state of West Virginia. Interesting. I would have thought that medical professionals and the Bureau of Public Health would want to know that. And I would have thought it had been tagged at, at a minimum. Yeah. So. Uh, Senator Rucker, thank you so much for your time this morning. We always, always very much appreciate it. No problem. Thanks so much. I hope you guys have a great day. You Thanks. too. Thanks, Patricia.